All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds on this Sunday, Friday, sunny Friday afternoon. Uh, our speaker this week is well known to many here as one half of the incredibly helpful kidney liver, liver service at the Montlake campus. Dr. Carrie Payne is an assistant professor in the Division of Nephrology here at the University of Washington. He grew up not far from here in Issaquah, Washington, before heading out to the Midwest, where he completed his medical school at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He returned to Seattle for residency and fellowship at the University of Washington, where he has stayed on as clinical faculty in the Division of Nephrology. In 2016, he co-started the Kidney Liver Program here at UWMC Montlake with Dr. Raymond Pitchler, where he helps direct the complex care of patients with both liver and kidney disease. Through his research and care of these patients, he has become an expert in topics, including the care of patients with hepatorenal syndrome, the use of albumin infusion for the treatment of hepatorenal physiology, and intraoperative dialysis during liver transplantation. We're so grateful for his care of patients and even more delighted to have him here today to share this knowledge with us as today's Grand Round speaker. As always, feel free to leave questions in the chat at any time during today's presentation, and we will reserve some time at the end to answer these and any other questions that may come up. Thanks, Dr. Payne, and feel free to get started. <clears throat> thank you, Johnny. Um, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation. I am thrilled to be here virtually at Medicine Grand Rounds giving um, uh, this talk to you all. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, the talk today is on hepatorenal syndrome. I have no relevant disclosures. I will be discussing the investigational use of terlipressin and the off-label use of several medications, including midadrenoctriotide, terlipressin, and norepinephrine. It's not a disclosure so much, but I, I should probably let you know that I'm the proud father of a, of a two-month-old currently going through a sleep regression. Uh, you can see their uh, uh, older brother and sister there, and so if I stumble on words, um, this is my plea for, for mercy. So I think it's important to establish at the outset, you know, why talk about hepatorenal syndrome? Why talk about hepatorenal syndrome in medicine grand rounds? It's a relatively uncommon condition. Well, I think a small portion of you, at least maybe, will be um, interested in the fascinating renal physiology. Um, and, and I think it's a good opportunity to review some fundamental principles of renal physiology that are applicable beyond HRS. It's timely. So in March, this is sort of like the Super Bowl for a kidney liver nephrologist. We had two hepatorenal relevant papers published in the New England Journal. It's a little bit like your team went to the Super Bowl and then lost. And we'll talk about some of the findings from the confirmed trial later, but, um, but it's timely. And, and if neither of those are, are compelling, then hopefully it just makes a good story for you to listen to while you eat your lunch and, and look out at the sunshine. My objectives today are to go over some of the physiological drivers that are underlying kidney dysfunction and cirrhosis. We'll talk about definitions and with that, how to diagnose a patient with hepatorenal syndrome. And then we'll talk about treatment or as I'm increasingly you know, fond of calling it more management of these patients um, because uh, you will see um, the number of things that are truly available to treat hepatorenal syndrome are quite few. I'm gonna attempt to uh, train myself and use the term HRS AKI um, for the, the entity that was previously known as type one HRS. Um, this has become the preferred term in the literature. If I slip into saying type one HRS, um, that's a habit that's hard to break, but HRS AKI is, is the preferred term now. And so that's what I will try to use. So we're gonna tell the story of hepatorenal syndrome through the years. Obviously we're here just to orient you at Medicine Grand Rounds. My history with hepatorenal syndrome is obviously shorter than this timeline. Mine starts at the University of Chicago when I was a medical student rotating in the ICU. And this paper came out in the New England Journal in 2009. And I read it and I said to myself, well, that is really interesting. I hope to understand that better someday. And so I just wanna reiterate that it's, it's truly an honor to, um, to, to present today to you all um, on something that, that I have found fascinating for the entirety of my relatively short medical career. Um, thankfully, the story goes back much farther than me. And so for, for our purposes, we're gonna start back here 
in the 1950s when hepatorenal syndrome was first described in the literature. So with respect to our surgical colleagues, um, they will claim um, hepatorenal syndrome started showing up in their literature first, and this was in the 1930s in reference to the kidney failure that was sometimes noted after abdominal surgery. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this except to say that this is a decidedly different clinical syndrome. And you can see here, we're talking about pathological findings in the kidneys of leukocytic infiltration and interstitial hemorrhage and, and something that is fundamentally different than what we will come to define as hepatorenal syndrome. But that's the first time you're gonna see it show up in the literature. I think the first time that really truly what we know today is hepatorenal syndrome as a clinical entity showed up in the literature was in the 1950s. And so we're gonna start the meat of the talk with a case from the archives. This was published in The Lancet back in 1956. And while it is a historical case, I think you're going to see a lot of similarities with some of the patients that we care for here at the Montlake campus and elsewhere in our system. So this is the case of a 52 year old woman who you'll see here in the description has several physical findings that we've come to associate with a diagnosis of cirrhosis. She has jaundice and spider angiomata. She <clears throat> has ascites and edema. So what we identify of course as evidence of portal hypertension. And she is pretty unwell. You'll see that starting in March of 1955, she becomes sick. Um, she is hypotensive. She is oliguric. She becomes azotemic with a rising blood urea <clears throat> level um, and, and hyponatremic, which is obviously another common physical manifestation of our cirrhotic patients. Today, we would describe at least her kidney problem with the term acute kidney injury. That wasn't in use back then. And unfortunately for this patient, she continues to get sicker. Uh, her hypotension progresses to the point where she requires noradrenaline to support her blood pressures. Uh, she becomes stuporous or encephalopathic, and eventually she dies about a month uh, after being admitted to hospital. On autopsy or necropsy, you'll see here um, that she had a cirrhotic liver, no surprise there, but she had normal kidneys. And so, like I said, this is not those post-surgical patients that are being described as having grossly abnormal kidneys on autopsy. This patient who had kidney failure, remember azotemia, oliguria, had normal kidneys on autopsy. If you prefer a graphical representation of what we just talked about, you can see this really lovely figure. I don't think we make figures the way they made them then. Um, this patient was, of course, hypotensive. She was azotemic, she was hyponatremic, oliguric, and had sodium retention, another feature of what we'll talk about with hepatorenal syndrome. But she, again, had normal kidneys. And so how is someone who's manifesting all of these clinical abnormalities have ab absolutely normal kidneys on autopsy? That's the question that we have to answer today. In the 1960s, it was fashionable to call this syndrome functional renal failure, really to sort of underscore the, the notion that the kidneys weren't the problem, right? So these were kidneys that worked pretty well. And in fact, mentions of hepatorenal syndrome in the literature declined in the 50s and 60s, really as people tried to sort of get away from the notion of a hepatorenal syndrome to you know, functional renal failure in the context of liver cirrhosis. You'll see here that hepatorenal syndrome mentions in the literature really skyrocket starting at the end of the 1960s. So what happened there? Well, in 1969, kidneys from patients who had hepatorenal syndrome were transplanted into patients who had kidney failure, who were on dialysis, but who had normal livers. And remarkably, what you'll see is that those kidneys worked just fine. So here are the kidneys when they're in the donors who had cirrhotic livers. Here's the time of transplant. And then here is an aggregate of 
what happened with those kidneys once they were transplanted. And I think perhaps most remarkable is over the course of about a month and a half, you'll see the urine volume increased remarkably such that those kidneys worked well and these patients came off of dialysis. I tell my patients that I see now, we're not gonna take your kidneys out of you and transplant them into someone else. What we would prefer to do is to transplant your liver. And indeed, it was shortly thereafter that liver transplant was performed in three patients with hepatorenal syndrome and led to recovery of those kidneys. Liver transplant alone, not kidney transplant, you'll see that at the time of transplantation, a marked increase in the urine volume and a decrease in the BUN, increase in the creatinine clearance, suggesting that those kidneys worked just fine once they were in uh, a patient who had a healthy liver. This is really, I think, miraculous in a sense, because without a liver transplant, this is a profoundly mortal condition. So if you look at all patients with cirrhosis who have AKI and then stratify them out according to the severity of AKI, you'll see survival over the course of a month, not, not greater than 20% in those with the most severe stage of AKI. And when you look just at hepatorenal syndrome, so again, type one HRS is the condition we're con concerned with today, you'll see just an astounding uh, a drop in survival such that very few patients survive beyond three months. And so transplant for these patients um, and the improvement of kidney function afterwards, um, I, I still feel is, is, is fairly miraculous. Okay, so let's, uh, having at least painted a picture of the clinical um, uh, scenario, let's dive into the physiology that's underpinning this. Well, we start with cirrhosis, right? Because uh, cirrhosis is the, um, and, and physiologic uh, changes that happen in cirrhosis really is the, the sentinel event here. And more specifically, it's not just the intrahepatic uh, vascular resistance in cirrhosis, but it's really the development of portal hypertension that I see as the sentinel event in the development of hepatorenal syndrome. Increasingly, we also appreciate that bacterial translocation in patients with cirrhosis is probably playing a role here. And the combination of these things combines to lead to splanchnic arterial vasodilation. And there's a whole other talk to be given on this, but this is mediated at least in part by inflammatory uh, mediators such as nitric oxide, inflammatory cytokines, endogenous cannabinoids. And with that splanchnic arterial vasodilation, we see a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance and low effective arterial blood volume. And after portal hypertension, I would say this is really the hallmark of what becomes this kind of entity that I'll refer to as hepatorenal physiology. So low effective arterial blood volume. Well, what happens as a response to the low effective arterial blood volume? So the <clears throat> uh, activation of arterial baroreceptors um, is a normal response to that. Obviously, the kidneys are being hypoperfused. And in response to that, we see various neurohumoral mediators or systems turned on. We see the non-osmotic stimulation of antidiuretic hormone or arginine vasopressin. I'm going to talk more about that. We see sympathetic nervous system activation. And we see uh, activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And it's these seemingly sensible compensatory responses that wind up having downstream effects that physically manifest as hepatorenal syndrome in our patients. So first, the non-osmotic stimulation of ADH leads to water retention. And this is what I mean by this is a chance to sort of go back and solidify things that maybe non-nephrologists don't think about every day. So what is the ADH system? Well, remember, ADH can be turned on either by an increase in your plasma osmolality, so you're out walking in the desert not drinking water and your sodium goes up, or by a decrease in your effective arterial blood volume. Obviously, we're not dealing with an increase in plasma osmolality here. We're, we're dealing with lack of effective arterial blood volume. And, and so AD, ADH is released and that increases aquaporins in the kidney, which leads to 
water retention. So you concentrate your urine and you retain water. This manifests as an increase in the urine osmolality. And that's one of the things that we frequently look for in these patients. And then as a result of water retention, we see a decrease in plasma osmolality, which helps to explain in part why our patients are hyponatremic and an increase in the effective arterial blood volume, or at least theoretically. It's not always enough, but that's physiologically what's, what's occurring. So we see water retention. We also see salt or sodium retention. And, and this is a chance for us to go back and remind ourselves what's happening in the RAS system. So remember in response to either hypotension or a decrease in effective arterial blood volume, which leads to renal hypoperfusion, we see a decreased delivery of sodium and chloride to the macula densa and a decrease in the afferent arterial stretch within the kidney. And I'm not gonna go through every single sort of arrow in this pathway, but in broad strokes, we see the activation of renin and then angiotensin and aldosterone, and ultimately an increase in renal sodium reabsorption. And so what do we look for in these patients? We look at their urine sodium, and if they're reabsorbing sodium, then we should see this manifested as a low or sometimes undetectable urine sodium. The net result of this is extracellular volume expansion, right? Because sodium determines your extracellular volume, you're reabsorbing sodium, and this is why our patients frequently manifest as having ascites. Okay, so we have salt retention, and then the combined uh, effect of these three systems, uh, ADH, RAS, and sympathetic nervous system, is to increase your systemic vascular resistance. So let's put this all together and explain what happens when things go wrong. So we have our cirrhotic patient, they have a low systemic vascular resistance as a result of uh, splanctic vasodilation and then systemic vasodilation, and they have a low effective arterial blood volume. And we've already talked about all these things, uh, the neurohumoral responses to retain water, to uh, retain sodium, and to try to increase your SVR. Of course, you also see an increase in the cardiac output, and this is clear to anyone who's ever uh, examined a patient with cirrhosis, right? You tend to expect that hyperdynamic uh, heart. And the sum total here leads to the maintenance of arterial circulatory integrity or um, uh, attempts to do that. And it really isn't until something happens uh, to destabilize that, that we see the kidneys suffer. So this could be the progression of the liver disease and just, you know, things have gotten worse and the SVR is so low that none of these other mechanisms matter. One of the, the hallmarks of, of hepatorenal is this progressive kidney uh, intrarenal vasoconstriction, or sometimes we'll see in the, in the setting of infection or bleeding, uh, SBP being the most common infection, that the, the, the you're no longer able to maintain circulatory integrity. And that's really when these patients wind up in kidney failure. And so hepatorenal syndrome is the syndrome in which this physiology is active and the kidneys are no longer served by these neurohumoral responses um, and, uh, and they wind up in acute kidney injury. Okay, well, that was um, probably several lectures worth of, of kidney physiology in, in a nutshell there. Um, I'm gonna pause and take a drink of water and then we'll, we'll talk about how to diagnose hepatorenal syndrome. So the first attempt to really sort of put some diagnostic criteria here was in 1978. And uh, a group of folks got together in Sassari, Italy, which looks like a wonderful place to get together and talk about the kidneys. And they came up with a set of criteria. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because it's not gonna look exactly like what we use today. They're talking about the ratio of urine to plasma osmolality, the ratio of urine to plasma creatinine. There's some focus on central venous pressure and then some you know, even focus on post-mortem histology. None of these I think are, are reflective of what we currently do. And so of course, they got together again in 1996, this time in Rome, and they revised these criteria. And at this point, they start to look 
a little bit more like what we think of as the criteria for hepatorenal syndrome now. We're trying to define what AKI looks like. We're excluding other potential diagnoses, but still here, you know, urine osmolality greater than plasma osmolality and sort of a focus on the urine volume. Um, these have fallen out of fashion. And so I think you can imagine where they got together um, in 2015, back in Italy, this time in Venice, and they came up with the current uh, criteria that we use to define hepatorenal syndrome. And I'm going to go through these kind of one by one, but in general, it's not that complicated. So, so what you need is you need to have cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And, uh, and I think it's true to say that if you have portal hypertension in the absence of cirrhosis, you can develop hepatorenal physiology, but that's not the most common scenario. So really, I think you have to have cirrhosis and portal hypertension or, or, or else you need to think that this is probably a different physiology at play. You need to have acute kidney injury. Well, that's quite clear. And in an attempt to define what that means for these patients, they use something called the International Club of Ascites AKI criteria, which is fairly wordy, but this is gonna look like what you think of when you think of AKI. We're talking about an increase in serum creatinine of 0.3 or a percentage increase of greater than or equal to 50% from baseline. I don't pay too much attention to AKI stages, and I think that's probably true of most of my colleagues, but they do have some, some verbiage in there about the stages of AKI, which has some prognostic value. So your patient has to have AKI, they have to have cirrhosis, that's not surprising. Importantly, they need to not be responsive to a challenge of uh, volume expansion. And this really should be done with intravenous albumin. Um, I, I wish I had time to go into all of the data on albumin. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more of it later. Um, but a conventional, what we call albumin challenge for these folks involves giving them concentrated albumin, one gram per kilogram per day for two days, up to about a hundred grams a day. So if your patient is more than that, you know, you cap it at a hundred. And, and if they respond to that, then by definition, uh, they were intravascularly volume depleted and don't have hepatorenal syndrome. Um, if they don't respond to that, then they may indeed have hepatorenal syndrome. And, and then you need to not have a clear alternate explanation for their AKI. And this is, I think, where it maybe gets a little bit tricky, but in general, um, I think rather sensible. So no evidence of glomerular disease. So that would be you know, hematuria or significant proteinuria, um, they will, they will um, specify not more than 500, you know, milligrams of proteinuria. I think the devil's in the details, but in general, I, I want to rule out evidence of glomerular disease. No recent nephrotoxic medications. I'm sure there's, you know, folks who would like to debate whether contrast is indeed nephrotoxic, but I think in these patients who are chronically volume depleted, it probably is. So I would say they need to not have received recent nephrotoxic medications and they need to not be in, in shock. Um, so your patient who's in septic shock, that's really the predominant physiology, uh, not hepatorenal physiology. And so uh, the last time I gave this talk to a group of nephrologists, I was asked the question, is hepatorenal syndrome a diagnosis of exclusion? And I've actually been mulling this over quite a bit over the last couple of months. So, you know, if you go to the textbook of record up to date, uh, the answer is yes. The hepatorenal syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and, and I think strictly speaking, that's probably true. Of course, anytime we see a patient with AKI, we wanna consider a broad differential diagnosis. And so some of the things that either myself or Dr. Pitchler think about when we see these patients, we look at pre-renal uh, causes of AKI. We make sure the patient's not volume depleted. Of course, we consider hepatorenal syndrome. We know that our patients can develop a cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And so could they be actually manifesting more of a, a, a cardiorenal phenotype? Uh, we, we consider ATN, of course, the most common cause of AKI in hospitalized patients. We appreciate, appreciate uh, increasingly that patients who are cholemic, so have high levels of bilirubin, also have high levels of bile acids, which are toxic to the tubules. That's an interesting condition that we sometimes see. And we know that these patients do have, on occasion, glomerular disease, so IgA, 
Um, nephropathy has been described in cirrhotics. Uh, an MPGN pattern has been described. Of course, our patients can be obstructive or they can sometimes have abdominal compartment syndrome related to tense societies. And so we want to consider a broad differential diagnosis, but then we start letting things fade away. We've ruled out obstruction. We've ruled out these other things. And frequently we're left with this question of, okay, so I see a little bit of tubular injury on, uh, on sediment, but the patient sure seems like they're behaving like they have hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Have I excluded ATN? And, and I think that sometimes with diagnoses of exclusion, we're afraid to really put our nickel down, as we say. And so I would argue that if you meet these criteria, so you have cirrhosis and AKI, you've not responded to, to albumin, and you have no clear alternate explanation, and your patient has evidence of hepatorenal physiology as manifested by activation of ADH. We talked about that, right? With a high urine osmolality or RAS activation with a low urine sodium. If they have low effective arterial blood volume and renal hypoperfusion, then I would say that uh, you can make the diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome and feel confident of it as the predominant lesion even in your patient who may have some evidence of tubular injury or some other things going on, because it's never quite as clear as we would want it to be in order to enroll someone in a clinical trial, right? And so I like to, to encourage the fellows that I work with, uh, the house staff that I work with to, to make a diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome and feel confident in that and not just feel like they've pretty well ruled everything else out. And there it goes, ATN. So now we've made our diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome. Okay. But the remaining sort of half of the talk, I want to kind of go through the various treatment algorithms and then talk a little bit about where I see hepatorenal uh, syndrome and the care of patients with hepatorenal syndrome going in the future. So in all patients with AKI and cirrhosis, you know, sort of the first steps are are the ones that are gonna happen probably before I've even consulted on the patient. You're gonna stop diuretics and you're gonna initiate this albumin challenge, which we spoke about. So this is giving concentrated albumin, 100 grams a day for, for two days. And this of course increases effective arterial blood volume. You're giving a colloid. It has oncotic effects and it increases the effective arterial blood volume that way. But it's increasingly appreciated that albumin has non-oncotic effects too. And I don't wanna to digress too much, but I think it's worth noting that albumin has been shown independent of its oncotic properties to decrease systemic vasodilation and to decrease uh, mediators of systemic vasodilation. Probably the best, um, Depiction of this is in the SORT trial where they looked at giving albumin and SBP, which is now standard of care, right? We do this on days one and three after diagnosis of SBP. And if you looked at the plasma renin activity on days three, six, and nine after the administration of either uh, antibiotics or antibiotics plus albumin, you'll see the plasma renin activity is much, much lower in those patients that received albumin in addition to antibiotics. Um, subsequent studies have proven that this really does seem to be independent of the oncotic effects of albumin. And so I'm fond of saying that, you know, it binds up the evil humors, um, but instead of, you know, yellow bile, we're binding nitric oxide, we're binding those inflammatory uh, cytokines, or at least decreasing the inflammatory cytokines. And there is good evidence that it binds to endogenous cannabinoids. Um, and so, so albumin is something that is useful and something that we use a lot. We'll talk about maybe a little bit later whether it has, it has some potential harm associated with it as well. So we're gonna albumin challenge and then assess whether your patients are improving. And if they are, then well, by definition, we've already covered this, they don't have HRS AKI. If they're not improving, then we move on in our algorithm to the use of vasoconstrictors plus albumin. Um, and in case I forget to say it subsequently, what I mean by vasoconstrictors plus albumin is not that we just continue pumping patients with 100 grams of albumin daily for the duration of treatment, but in all clinical trials looking at vasoconstrictors, patients have been uh, treated with between 20 and 40 grams of albumin per day, unless 
albumin was one of the things on trial. Um, and so, uh, so it's our convention and the recommendation to, regardless of the vasoconstrictor given, to use between 20 and 40 grams of albumin per day, unless there's a contraindication such as pulmonary edema. Okay, so uh, where do vasoconstrictors fall on our timeline? Well, really we're talking about, about the last 25 years here. And it was in the late nineties that this combination of midodrin and octreotide was first introduced as a potential treatment for HRS. So what are midodrin and octreotide and, and, how, and do they work? So midodrin is an oral alpha adrenergic agonist. So it's given typically three times a day uh, orally. And octreotide is a somatostatin analog that uh, is a nonspecific inhibitor of endogenous vasodilators. It's typically given subcutaneously, but can be given intravenously. And the first, uh, I hesitate to call it study, but um, uh, evidence that perhaps this was beneficial was published in the late 1990s. Um, it was a single center retrospective non-randomized trial in which they looked at 13 patients. And this is a pretty low number of patients, although you won't be impressed if you're used to cardiology trials by the numbers of patients in the subsequent trials I'm gonna talk about. Um, 13 patients with cirrhosis and HRS who either received dopamine, kind of an odd control group, right? Considering that that is not part of our treatment algorithm uh, in 2021, um, or and octreotide dosed as I just discussed. And what did they see? Well, all those patients who got dopamine got worse with the exception of one. This is serum creatinine over the course of 10 or 20 days here. And the patients who got midodrin octreotide in a retrospective fashion were observed to have gotten better. And so this was um, the beginning of a number of subsequent studies looking at this combination as a possible treatment for hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, another single center retrospective non-randomized trial probably provides the most compelling evidence for the use of midodrin and octreotide, which is not to say it's terribly compelling, but the most compelling looking at 81 patients with cirrhosis who got either midodrin, octreotide, and albumin or albumin alone. So at least that's a little bit more rational than giving uh, dopamine. And what was noted here was that the use of midodrin, octreotide was associated both with an improvement in AKI and in survival at 30 days. And so you'll see here in the group that received midodrin and octreotide, 40% of them had a reduction in their creatinine um, uh, and, and uh, only 43% died at 30 days, whereas in the control, control group, virtually none of them had a reduction in their creatinine and 71% um, had died at 30 days. And so is midodrin octreotide better than just using albumin? I think it probably is. Um, but again, this was not prospective, um, nor was it randomized. And so I think this data needs to be taken with a huge grain of salt. In the sort of latter part of the 1990s and then through the early 2000s up until about 2015, we see a number of trials looking at something called terlipressin for the treatment of HRS. We'll talk more about terlipressin obviously when we talk about the confirmed trial. But terlipressin is a vasopressin analog with affinity for both V1 and V2 receptors. And one of the appealing things about terlipressin is that it can be given IV as an IV push on the acute care floor, or at least conventionally, that's how it's given, as opposed to as a continuous infusion in the intensive care unit. So probably the most relevant study looking at the use of terlipressin, having just talked about midodrin octreotide, would be this multi-center prospective randomized trial looking at terlipressin versus midodrin octreotide. Both groups received albumin in the treatment of 49 patients with cirrhosis and HRS. And so they were randomized either to get terlipressin three to 12 milligrams per day, usually in Q6 hour intervals, or midodrin and octreotide dose of, as we've already discussed. And uh, apologize for the blurry figure, but if you look here, this is the terlipressin group. Gray bars were those who had either a complete or partial response. 
and white bars were those who had a complete response. And so over 50% of the patients in the terlipressin group had a complete response, so normalization of their serum creatinine, whereas virtually none of the metadronotriotide patients did, and only a small fraction of them had a partial response. There have been many subsequent trials of terlipressin um, or uh, other vasopressin analogs, such that it is really, you know, in places where terlipressin is available, um, thought to be one of the mainstays of treatment for HRS. And so there's long been an interest in getting terlipressin approved for use in the United States. I don't have time to go into the details of this whole saga, and I'm not sure I know all the ins and outs of this saga, but despite several prior trials, the FDA had not approved terlipressin, talking um, mostly about concerns about its safety profile. And so uh, you can file that away in, in, in your head um, as we uh, sort of pause on terlipressin and look uh, to the confirmed trial later because safety is going to be a big question there. So terlipressin ruled in the sort of, uh, in, in Europe in the early 2000s and continues today to be a, a preferred treatment. But then in, you know, around 2014 or somewhere between 2010 and 2014, um, people began to become interested in norepinephrine as a possible alternative to terlipressin. So norepinephrine we're all familiar with. This is an alpha and beta agonist that's given as a continuous infusion. And in this randomized prospective single center trial of 46 patients with cirrhosis, terlipressin was compared to norepinephrine. Um, I, I want to just make a brief comment and say that they, they titrated the norepinephrine to aim for an increase of MAP of 10 millimeters of mercury, regardless of the starting MAP. And I don't share it in this talk, but there's re, uh, some good retrospective data suggesting that those patients who respond to vasoconstrictors of any type are those who have an increase in MAP of 10 millimeters per mercury. And so that sometimes is a threshold that we will shoot for, recognizing that that retrospective data may just be selecting for those who were gonna respond anyway. But so an increase in MAP of 10 millimeters of mercury is what we sometimes shoot for. And in this, uh, the two groups did very similarly. So obviously both had um, pretty uh, disheartening survival curves, um, but they were not any different. And in a subsequent meta-analysis of several studies looking at norepinephrine and terlipressin, norepinephrine was demonstrated to be non-inferior to terlipressin, both with respect to reversal of hepatorenal syndrome and with respect to mortality. In the same meta-analysis, uh, it looked that um, uh, with these four trials, uh, norepinephrine was favored with respect to adverse events. And so um, I think that's important, and it certainly factors into how we think of norepinephrine as a treatment for our patients who are physically located in the hospital in a place where they can receive it. I'll, I'll you know, maybe sum up the existing vasoconstrictor data with this algorithm. Um, so, so if your patient has not responded to albumin and they're in the intensive care unit, then I think it's pretty much uh, agreed upon at this point that the first line treatment should be norepinephrine and albumin. If they're not in the intensive care unit, then you have to ask yourself whether terlipressin is available as an option. And if you're practicing outside of the United States, it might be. And so terlipressin and albumin is the recommended uh, first line treatment for those patients out of the intensive care unit if you have access to terlipressin. If terlipressin is not available, then a short trial of metadrenonotriotide plus albumin can be considered. But, uh, you know, the, the reason I, I, I termed it this way, and this is what's starting to show up in the literature, is that it's pretty clear that metadrenonotriotide is not as good as certainly norepinephrine in a monitored setting at reversing or managing hepatorenal syndrome. And so if you do, do improve, that's great. Um, but if you don't improve after a short trial, and what do I mean by short? Probably 36 to 48 hours on metadronotriotide, then increasingly um, we're thinking about transfer to the intensive care unit and starting on norepinephrine. Okay, so that brings us up pretty much to 2020 or 2021 um, when the confirmed trial was published 
in March. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that uh, before I sum up and, and talk about a few sort of uh, extra details at the end. So what was the confirmed trial? So it was a multi-center prospective randomized trial. The University of Washington was a participant and I was the site PI. I will tell you that we're pretty stringent in our, uh, in our diagnosis of, of how to renal syndrome, at least as it re, um, relates to study criteria. And so we only enrolled one patient here and another patient at Harborview. Uh, that aside, this was the largest trial ever done in hepatorenal syndrome, 300 patients who had cirrhosis and hepatorenal syndrome. And they were randomized in a two to one fashion to receive either terlipressin. So uh, the dosing here is similar to in prior studies plus albumin or placebo, which was albumin alone. I think um, there are probably uh, several of you wondering, well, why, why placebo and not metadronotriotide? Is that appropriate? And I think that that serves to uh, demonstrate how uh, effective a treatment metadronotriotide are thought to be for this condition. Um, Terlopressin versus placebo was thought to be an appropriate uh, uh, trial structure. And so what did we find or what did they find? So um, with respect to HRS reversal, terlopressin was better. So 32% of patients had reversal of hepatorenal syndrome, which was defined as an improvement in their serum creatinine um, uh, to less than 1.5, I believe. And this was significant. Um, there was no difference between mortality or uh, whether they uh, survived or received a liver transplant. And the concerning signal that I sort of alluded to earlier was that the terlopressin group had a 14% incidence of respiratory failure, whereas only 5% in the placebo group did. And this was not a signal that was hinted at in earlier trials of terlopressin or any other vasoconstrictors in hepatorenal syndrome, I should say. And so this is um, adapted from data that was presented to the FDI or to the FDA um, last year, looking at the time from first dose um, and then the incidence of respiratory failure. And you can see that really from you know, the outset here, uh, the probability of respiratory failure in the terlopressin group um, rises relatively sharply. There are, I guess, some possible mechanistic explanations for this. So you're giving a vasoconstrictor, which is going to increase afterload. Is it doing that enough to cause cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Perhaps, although so do other vasoconstrictors. That's why we give them, and this hadn't been seen in those. And so albumin has kind of come in the, the crosshairs here um, as a potential culprit I think this is in part because in the same issue of the New England Journal, the entire trial was published, which I'm not going to get into too much, except to say that they were looking here at all hospitalized patients with cirrhosis and treating to a serum albumin target, which is not something that we ever do, um, and showed no benefit to albumin, but um, a higher incidence of pulmonary edema uh, in the albumin group. And so obviously albumin is a little bit of, um, you know, a scapegoat um, right now, or, or sort of fashionable to, to uh, criticize albumin. And so the question of was albumin to blame in the confirmed trial comes up. Uh, the answer is I'm not sure. So there was no difference in the amount of albumin received in the two groups. If you look at the terlopressin group, it does seem like the more albumin you got, so this is stratified, was associated with, you know, a higher incidence of uh, respiratory failure, uh, significant adverse events. And a similar trend was not witnessed in the placebo group. Um, so, so it probably was a factor. I'm, I'm certainly not going to say it wasn't, um, but it really is the combination of albumin and terlopressin or albumin and vasoconstrictors and not necessarily just the albumin because a similar trend was not witnessed in the placebo group. So Malincrot, uh, the pharmaceutical company was rather uh, bullish, I think last year about their prospects for getting terlopressin approved finally in this country. Um, that has not been the case. And in fact, I got this email uh, 20 minutes ago. And so through a slide in here, um, 
that, uh, you know, they're, they're still pursuing a path forward, um, but it's not clear that, uh, that the FDA is going to be sympathetic to the claims that terlipressin should be uh, approved based on the confirmed trial. And so where does this leave us with our, al uh, with our algorithm? Well, I think it, it, it solidifies the fact that terlipressin is not available here. Um, and I think you probably need to ask the question if you're practicing somewhere where terlipressin is available, is this still um, the, the tr a treatment that we should be reaching for? I've not seen anyone come out and advocate for stopping the use of terlipressin in places where it's currently available. Um, but it would, it would cause me to ask the question if, if I had a patient in front of me and had the option of, of prescribing terlipressin. And so, so where do we go from here? And so this isn't necessarily a sort of future section, but it gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about what we have been doing here at the University of Washington Montlake campus over the last several years and what we intend to do in the future. And I talked a little bit about this earlier, but mentally as a nephrologist, my job is, you know, I sometimes think of as to protect the kidneys. Um, and I think with hepatorenal syndrome, the, the, you know, paradigm really needs to shift from treatment to management. There is only one treatment for hepatorenal syndrome, and it doesn't matter how many vasoconstrictor trials are published. Really what we're talking about, if there's going to be a treatment for this, is a liver transplantation, right? And so the way I sometimes view my job is, you know, I have a patient who's on this path or this road who has HRS AKI, and my job as a nephrologist taking care of them is to define what's at the end of this path and how best to get there. So in the case of someone who's a transplant candidate, that's fairly simple. We progress as we've talked about to albumin, vasoconstrictors, and then to liver transplantation. But what if liver transplant is not an option for that patient? And instead they are preferring to, to focus on, on, on comfort focus measures. Um, do we go directly there or is there a role still for albumin and vasoconstrictors and then comfort focused care? Or what if the patient is not currently a transplant candidate because they need to go home and engage in outpatient chemical dependency treatment? Is this someone who we can use vasoconstrictors for or are there other options like a TIPS that might allow us to help discharge these patients to home? Lastly, I think, you know, how, how as a nephrologist, what is the role of dialysis here? Is dialysis something that we should be use, using when patients fail vasoconstrictors and then use that to get them to transplant or as a bridge to transplant? Or are there some patients that come in so volume overloaded and so, you know, bad off with respect to their kidneys that we should go directly to dialysis and then to liver transplantation? And obviously this web is a mess. And I think that's kind of the point, right? Um, these patients need individualized care. And that's what we as a section recognized five years ago when Dr. Pitchler and I created the kidney liver program <clears throat> at the direction or, uh, of, of, our, of our division leadership. So this was in 2016, we created the kidney liver program and. Of course, here's uh, a more youthful version of me and then my partner in crime, Raymond Pichler. Um, and we started the kidney liver program, really aiming to you know, provide comprehensive care for these patients, inpatient and outpatient through multiple readmissions on the path to whatever it is that might be at the end of that road for them, whether it's transplant or something else. And so I thought maybe I would just take a couple minutes to talk about our specific approach to some of it in nuances of our approach to some of these things. So the first is vasoconstrictors. And I would say that there's been an evolution over the last several years um, in our practice to move farther and farther or to shorten this you know, trial more and more, uh, recognizing that metadronotriotide really is not a great treatment for these folks. This has led us to focus more on um, transfer to the ICU, and we're very grateful to our ICU colleagues for helping us uh, to do that. Sometimes it seems a little bit crazy to take someone with a MAP of 65 and, and put them on norepinephrine in the intensive care unit, shooting for a MAP of 75. Um, but uh, I have several examples, some of whom are in the hospital right now, of patients who have benefited from that type of care. And I think in the years ahead, we're going to have to perhaps ask ourselves, 
if terlipressin is not available, or even if it is, if it's an inferior treatment, is uh, finding a way to safely administer norepinephrine in the acute care setting something that we want to think about? I think it's a bit of a provocative question and one that I don't have an answer to, um, but I think it's, it's part of the future question uh, about how to care for these patients. What about tips? So this is not something that I appreciated before um, taking this position five years ago, but, but TIPS is actually an excellent treatment for hepatorenal syndrome in a very small subset of patients. So if you have a patient who has hepatorenal syndrome, but has enough liver function that they can safely survive a TIPS, then we see urinary sodium excretion improve dramatically uh, following, uh, following TIPS procedure. And this makes sense, right? Because you're treating portal hypertension, which stood at the top of that algorithm of hepatorenal physiology and improvement in creatinine within a couple of weeks, such that the few patients that we've had who we've been able to get a TIPS for have actually either uh, been able to avoid dialysis entirely or come off dialysis after starting dialysis for hepatorenal syndrome, which is not something that uh, we tend to see very frequently. And then the last thing is, what about dialysis? And so the old paradigm, of course, and probably the paradigm with which many of you are familiar is to say, my patient has hepatorenal syndrome and they are not a transplant candidate, therefore dialysis is not an appropriate intervention for them. And I, I am not uh, someone who likes to be dogmatic, but there's good reason for that paradigm. And if we look at this retrospective data, looking at all patients with cirrhosis who were started on dialysis, looking at those who were not listed for liver transplant, regardless of whether you had hepatorenal syndrome or ATN, so the diagnosis doesn't even matter here, 84 or 85% of those patients died by six months. And the numbers aren't stellar for those who are listed for, for liver transplant, but the, the fact of the matter is that these patients are quite sick and they don't do well. Uh, that said, I think that the, there should be or has been a paradigm shift where we say, you know, we're not going to be dogmatic. We need to figure out what is the goal at the end of that path. Is it discharge from the hospital? Well, then if we think that we're going to be uh, able to dialyze the patient out of the hospital, meaning they have a blood pressure that can support dialysis in an outpatient dialysis unit. I'm not sure why uh, we should not consider dialysis for the patient with hepatorenal syndrome if it's within their goals of care. And I'll tell you, that's how Dr. Pichler and I have been practicing over the last several years, recognizing that it's very difficult. So in conclusion, and to leave a couple minutes for questions, Hepatorenal syndrome is the result of a complex physiological cascade. It starts with portal hypertension. It ends with salt and water retention and severe kidney vasoconstriction. And there are not good treatments for this, despite the fact that we had a study published in the New England Journal a month ago, the only definitive treatment for HRS, AKI, in 2021 is liver transplantation. So short of liver transplantation, I think these patients should be managed individually. This isn't personalized medicine as the term has, been come, to known, uh, has come to be known, um, but individually guided by their physiology and the available treatments, um, and importantly, by the, the goals of care for that patient. And I feel very strongly that patients with this condition are best served by a collaborative multidisciplinary team. And so with that, I want to say thank you to all the patients that I've had the privilege of taking care of uh, over the last several years. And, and thank you to the, the collaborative multidisciplinary team that I've been able to work with. Uh, I can't name everyone, but of course, uh, I've mentioned Dr. Pichler a couple of times, uh, my fellow nephrologists, the dialysis folks here who really perform uh, dialysis that uh, I, I'm fond of saying can't be done anywhere else in the city, um, our hepatologists, our internal medicine and ICU providers, the transplant surgeons and the transplant social work team. And then of course the palliative care doctors who I think are invaluable in helping us with these patients. So thank you to, to all of those folks. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Payne. That was an, uh, an amazing talk. Uh, you preempted a lot of my own questions. Um, but uh, one thing that came up uh, was it seems like there's not a great way to target or risk stratify individuals to understand sort of 
right up front who should go down, which of the many pathways you drew in your web of, uh, of possibilities when a patient presents with cirrhosis and an AKI? Yeah, I mean, I think at the risk of being self-serving, I think, you know, you sort of notice patterns, right? And so, um, so I, I don't know that there's anything pathognomonic. I think I tend to have a sense for how some, you know, quickly someone's going to progress and, and maybe where they should uh, fall on that. Um, but, but you're right, there's been interest in using urinary biomarkers, which I didn't even talk about because I don't think that they're terribly useful for this condition, perhaps as an early marker for who might progress more quickly. I mean, urinary biomarkers aren't really helpful for a functional pre-renal state, right? Because um, they are by definition giving us an indication that there's tubular injury present. Um, so, so I don't know that there are good prognostic things aside from sort of the patient that you see in front of you and how they're progressing on hospital day one and two and three. No substitute for sort of clinical judgment and a good uh, base of experience. It sounds like no easy biomarker. One question that came up, you know, we use octreotide in addition to midodrin. Why don't we use it in addition to any other vasopressor? Um, uh, well, that's a good question. And I don't know. Um, the answer. So, so, you know, octreotide plus norepinephrine has not been studied. Um, of course we have patients who are on both of those, uh, if you have a GI bleed and you're, uh, but, um, <laughs> but not for the indication, um, uh, for hepatorenal syndrome. And so I won't make up an answer. I, I, am not sure I can make a good argument for, for why not to do that, except to say that, that, that octreotide doesn't seem to add a ton to midodrine. And so, um, so it, you know, it, it, it's not like it's a, I think it would be a, a miracle cure if it was added to norepi or terlopressin. I, I think I know what your answer is going to be to this, but if you had your druthers and you could redesign a confirmed trial with, instead of a placebo arm, what would you prefer as the active comparator? Yeah. So, I mean, if it were to mimic the way we practice, I think that it should have uh, looked at patients transferring to the intensive care unit to get norepinephrine. Um, because not treating them with midodrine octreotide, uh, I actually don't really have a problem with that. It was, but those patients didn't get treated with anything, right, aside from albumin. Uh, another thing I think we need to, you know, consider is, um, you know, when these trials are done, I'm not sure that a norepi in the ICU versus a terlopressin on the acute care floor trial would, would be hugely valuable either, because, you know, that patient in the intensive care unit who's getting a vaso with the monitoring that comes with the intensive care unit is probably going to have fewer adverse events, right, than the person who's only being monitored and titrated every six hours. And so, you know, really probably we need to have parity between the, you know, sort of phase of care that they're in and also, you know, the, the treatments they're receiving. Yeah, really interesting point. If you could even do a trial of acute care norepinephrine, it, it, that might be a more apples yeah. to apples comparison. One question came up was the, the specific definition of respiratory failure in the case of confirm. Was this new oxygen requirement or ju or something more severe like mechanical ventilation? Um, yeah, they actually stratified it. Um, so there was severe respiratory failure and then all respiratory failures. So, so severe, I think new oxygen requirement was... Um, was the sort of lowest one. And then um, need for mechanical ventilation was, was severe. Got it. And then a, a follow-up sort of similar question was in terms of historically, is there been a consistent definition of response to therapy in these trials? So, so there, there's not been a, a very consistent definition for response. Um, and, uh, and I think, so that, that's interesting from a you know, perspective of it, it, looking at clinical trials, but as a clinician who's looking at a patient on the wards, that's interesting too, right? Because when do we stop the treatment um, and, and, or, or when do we say that treatment hasn't worked? Everyone's in agreement that if you've been on something for two weeks and it's not working, it's not working. Well, that's all well and good, but we need to know before the two week mark, right? So, um, or what about your patient who does respond? How do we, you know, stop the norepi and practices across the country and talking to colleagues vary so widely. So some people will keep you on norepinephrine after your creatinine has normalized for a week. Um, that seems like a tough sell to my MICU colleagues. And I'm not sure that it's worth doing that um, because presumably you're going to, you know, accumulate more adverse events to the treatment over those seven days. So, so we really don't have a good way for, for determining uh, when someone has responded well enough to come off of the treatment.
And I guess my last question, uh, you know, it seems like in the earlier studies or even case reports looking at HRS, there was more emphasis on monitoring of central venous pressures during the treatments. And it seems like in the confirmed trial that I, was that ever looked at? Or was there a difference in central venous pressures between these two groups? It was, it was not looked at in the confirmed trial, nor in many of the more recent um, trials. And I think probably what we're seeing there is because that's not the relevant data point, right? Uh, what we're concerned about is the lack of effective arterial blood volume. And so, um, you know, whether there's any utility in following the CBP, I think is questionable. Got it. Well, thank you so much for such an excellent talk, such a broad review of the sort of historical context in addition to the, the cutting edge. And uh, as you said, the recent Super Bowl, although a disappointing outcome, reemphasizes just how sick these patients are and how much they benefit from the kidney liver program. So thank you so much for your service to these patients and enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon. Thanks everyone for tuning into the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you, everyone.